Hi, I'm Jeremy Clark. I'm an assistant professor at Concordia University in Montreal. Today's lecture is on the history of cryptocurrencies. We'll look at all the technologies that led up to the invention of Bitcoin. Now, understanding the history of cryptocurrencies isn't essential to understanding how Bitcoin works. Thus, it wasn't part of the original lecture series. However, enough people thought that it would be an interesting subject to look at that we decided to release this as a bonus lecture to the original series. In this lecture, we'll look at the history of electronic payment systems. These will include digital cash proposals and broader proposals that tie into the credit card network. We'll also look at the history of certain primitives that Bitcoin uses that aren't directly related to eCash. We'll look at proof of work protocols and we'll look at secure timestamping schemes. Finally, at the end of the lecture, we'll reflect a bit on what we can learn about Satoshi and what he understood from the history of cryptocurrencies in the design of Bitcoin. Spoiler alert, we won't tell you who Satoshi Nakamoto is. The path to Bitcoin is littered with many failed attempts at e-cash systems and other credit card payment systems. Here's about 100 schemes that are notable in some regard. Some of them are academic proposals that have been well cited. Others are actual systems that were deployed and tested. Of all the names on this list, there's probably only one that you recognize. That's PayPal. It's the only current system that we have from the history of cryptocurrencies that's still being used today. In this portion of the lecture, we'll look at traditional financial arrangements. We're not going to give you a full history of cash and the ascent of money and all the things that went into the invention of cash, but we will look at some of the basics just to remind ourselves. They will help us understand the different types of proposals that we'll see. If we rewind in time and go back to a time before there was a government, before there was currency, uh, one system that worked for acquiring goods was barter. In a barter arrangement, you may have two people. For example, here we have one person who wants to have a tool, and we have another person that needs medicine. Now, if each of these has what the other person needs, uh, then they can do a, a swap, and they can both satisfy their needs. For example, this person can give medicine to the second person, and the second person can give a tool in return. Now, the problem with barter is, what happens when the two people don't have what the other wants? In this case, for example, we might assume that this person has food, which they're willing to trade for a tool, which they want. The other person has a tool, but they don't have, they don't have any need for food. They want medicine instead. This situation can be resolved with the introduction of new parties. For example, let's assume that there's a third person. This person wants food, and they have medicine available that they're willing to trade for food. In this case, it's possible to arrange a three-way swap where everyone gets what they need. Now, the drawback of a barter-based system is a coordination. It's hard to coordinate all three people to have them at the same place, but also to situate them in time, where everyone's needs and wants align in time so that they are able to complete this swap. In order to deal with this uh, drawback of barter, one of two systems emerged uh, to replace it. Uh, one system is credit, one system is cash. It's currently a subject of academic debate which of the two emerged first, for the purposes of this lecture, we don't really care about that debate. In a credit-based system, we can assume that the first person, for example, who needs a tool, they're able to acquire the tool from another person. However, they don't have the medicine that this person wants. All they can offer is food. Since this person doesn't want food, the arrangement could be that they still make the trade. Uh, the first person gets the tool, but the second person gets a favor that's owed to them in the future. In other words, this person has a debt uh, that they need to settle with this person in the future sometime. Now, we can say that this person's needs are satisfied. She acquired the tool that she wants, but really she has a new need as a result of this arrangement. She has a debt and she would at some point like to cancel that debt in the future. So that's her new want. Now, she can, at some future time, she may come across a third person. And in this case, the third person wants food, which she has. The third person is offering medicine. And if she remembers that medicine is what the person uh, she has a debt with uh, was wanted to acquire, then she can trade her food uh, for the medicine. And then when she has the medicine, she can go back to the original person and cancel the debt. As a result, everybody's happy. A second alternative we can look at is the cash-based systems. 
In this case, we'll assume the same scenario, except for in this case, we'll assume that this person also has some money, something of monetary value. In this case, uh, when this person wants to acquire a tool from someone who's offering the tool, they can offer cash instead since they don't want the food uh, that they have. So in this case, they do the swap. This person's satisfied, she has acquired her tool, and this person has acquired money, uh, which is the value of that tool. Then later, if this person happens to come across this person, she still wants medicine, this person is offering medicine, uh, she can swap it for the money. Okay. Finally, to complete the cycle, uh, the original person has food, this person needs food and has money, they can pay for the food. And the money goes back to the original person who held the money in the first place and everyone's needs are satisfied. Now we can contrast and compare cash systems versus credit systems. In a cash-based system, one requirement to bootstrap the system is you need an initial allocation of cash. The whole trading cycle would not have worked had the one person not originally had some cash on hand. By contrast, in a credit-based system, there's no allocation that's needed. It can work right out of the box. However, the credit-based system does have one drawback, and that is the party that gives the tool to the other party in exchange for a debt uh, is taking on some risk. There's a chance that that person never comes back and settles the, the debt. Cash also allows for a finer grain precision when you want to say how much something is worth. In barter-based systems, uh, it's hard to say if a tool is worth more than medicine or medicine is worth more than food. With cash, we can apply a mathematical quantity to how much something is worth. In, for these reasons, this is why we use a blended system today. We use a combined system of cash and credit where debts are measured in the amount of cash it would take to settle the debt. A fairly direct application of these ideas can be seen in some proposals for peer-to-peer -peer file sharing. Two systems that use these ideas are Mojo Nation and Karma. Mojo Nation was a short-lived project. It lived about two years, but it's sort of the intellectual ancestor of other protocols that are used today, like BitTorrent and Taohao Laughs. Karma, on the other hand, was an academic proposal. In both of these cases, we consider a peer-to-peer -peer, uh, file sharing system, where some people have files, say movies or music, uh, that they're offering uh, to send to other people in the network, and they'll do this in exchange for other files that they want to acquire. In this case, both of these systems suggested that users, when they enroll in the system, are allocated initially some amount of cash, called Mojo or Karma in the systems respectively. Then the users were able to spend this money to acquire the files that they want. So if you're downloading from someone else, then you're paying cash to that person. When someone comes to you and they get a file that you have that you're offering, they pay the cash back to you. And the idea is to try and keep your balance floating around the amount that you were initially allocated. This also solves the problem of arranging barter uh, between users. If different users have disjoint sets of files that they want to share and files that they want to acquire, then by using currency, they don't have to find that perfect person who has exactly what they need and is looking for exactly what they're offering. In this portion of the lecture, we'll begin looking at the history of payment systems that were invented prior to Bitcoin. We're going to start by looking at credit-based systems. In general, what you can do is you can take all the systems and sort them into two piles. There's pile based on credit systems and there's piles based on cash systems. Bitcoin obviously is in the pile of cash systems. However, we should also look at credit-based systems, even though Bitcoin's not part of that pile, because these are the systems that are competing with Bitcoin. Credit card transactions are the dominant payment method that is used on the web today. If you've ever bought something from a website such as Amazon, you know how the arrangement goes. Uh, you type in your credit card details, you send it to Amazon, and then Amazon turns around with these credit card details and they talk to the system, the financial system. We don't have to go into all the details of who the parties are that are involved in the financial system, but in general, there's a credit card processor and the credit card processor is going to talk to the banks, uh, the credit card companies, and other intermediaries. The other architecture that you may see if you use something like PayPal is an intermediary architecture. In this case, there's a company that sits between you and the website. So you send your credit card details to this company, it approves uh, the transaction and settles with the website. The advantages of this type of architecture are privacy. In this case, the user is never fully disclosing all their credit card details to the website. The drawback is that the, the user is no longer directly 
interacting with the website alone. The user has to interact with this intermediary. They have to be aware that the intermediary exists. They may have to have an account uh, with the intermediary. Now, an early system to use this type of architecture was a company called First Virtual. It was founded in 1994. First Virtual is an interesting company uh, because beyond just being one of the earliest players in doing electronic payments, they were also one of the earliest companies to try and set up a virtual office, as it was called. And that's why they called their company First Virtual. So in a virtual office, there was no physical office where people met. People were scattered uh, across the country, and they communicated through email on the internet. Now remember, in 1994, this was before the days of GitHub and Skype and Slack. And so it was very hard to uh, run a business this way. And they have an interesting paper outlining some of the challenges of that business model. But anyways, back to what they actually propose. What they propose is a system where both the user and the merchant sign up with First Virtual. They have an account. And then they conduct uh, transactions of electronic payments over email. The idea is that once you buy your, you put something in your cart and you say, I'd like to check out, what the merchant will do is they'll send an email to transfer at card.com, which is an email address run by First Virtual. And it will have all the details of the transaction. The user is then sent an email with the transaction details asking them to approve it. If the user emails back yes, then First Virtual will, will bill the credit card of the user, a credit card that the user had provided when they enrolled in the service. Then what will happen is First Virtual will wait to see if the user will dispute the credit card change. The user typically has 90 days to file a dispute. And so First Virtual will ride out these 90 days, and it's only on the 91st day that the merchant actually gets paid the money. This is a major drawback of the system, having to wait that long uh, to receive payment if you're a merchant. However, amazingly, it's not that much different than what happens today. Today, the merchant does get paid uh, immediately. However, there still is the threat that the uh, customer will file a chargeback or dispute the credit card. Uh, statement. And in this case, the merchant will have to pay the money back uh, to the credit card company. Two other systems to use this architecture are Open Market and NetBill. And when you look at these early protocols, what's interesting is to drill down and see at a protocol level what protocols they're using to send transactions back and forth. First Virtual, as mentioned, was based on email. There were other competing approaches. In Open Market, it was based on encoding information into the URL. For NetBill, they use a custom MIME type over HTTP. In the mid-90s, there was also a competing approach to the first virtual intermediary-based architecture. We'll call it the set architecture. Like the intermediary architecture, it also tries to address the problem of users not sending all of their credit card information to the merchants. It's actually remarkable that no one thought that was a good idea in the 90s. It wasn't until much later that that system became predominant. In this system, it also tried to address the idea of the user having to enroll with the intermediary. So what they decided uh, to pursue is an architecture where the user, once they've settled on the transaction that they want to conduct with the website, they only interact with the website. However, what they do is they take their view of what the transaction details are and they encode their credit card information, and they encrypt it such that some server, some third party can decrypt it, but the merchant cannot decrypt it. They send it to the merchant, and the merchant takes this information. Since it can't decrypt it, all it can do is blindly forward it onto the third party. However, they also append their own view of what the transaction looks like. Then the third party can decrypt both of these they can compare the views of the transactions, and if they align, they both say the same thing, uh, then they'll approve the transaction. Now, SET was uh, a standard that was developed by Visa and MasterCard in conjunction with a lot of technology companies at the time, Netscape, Microsoft, VeriSign, RSA. SET was uh, sort of had some intellectual ancestors. There was another company at the time called CyberCash, uh, IBM had a proposal called IKP that was later standardized into a standard called SEP. And Microsoft, working with Visa, had also developed their own standard. All of these used that same architecture that we just described. And so the idea of SET was to unify uh, this architecture, provide a specification where all of these systems would fit under the umbrella of SET. 
Now, CyberCache, the one company that went into SET, is an interesting company that we'll spend a few minutes looking at. CyberCache had very good relationships with the US government. Uh, in addition to their product that was based on credit cards, they also had a coin-based system, a digital cash-based system called CyberCoin. CyberCoin was a micropayment system. So what that meant is that you probably never have more than $10 in your account at any one given time. However, what CyberCash was able to do is they were out, able to actually get uh, FDIC insurance uh, for each account for up to $100,000. Back in the 90s when CyberCash was operating, there was also a restriction on the export of cryptography. Uh, cryptography was considered a weapon and so you couldn't export it uh, to, to other nations. In this case, CyberCash wanted to export their software. They wanted other people around the world to be able to use it. However, it used encryption technology. So normally this export would not be allowed. However, what uh, CyberCash was able to do is work with the State of Department to get a special exemption for their software. And the argument was that going into their software and extracting the encryption technology out of it would be way more work than it would take to just write the crypto from scratch. Also, leading into the year 2000, there was a lot of concern over a bug called the Y2K bug. The Y2K bug didn't turn out to be that big of a deal. There weren't a lot of systems that were influenced or affected by the bug. However, CyberCache has the dubious uh, distinction of being one that was affected by it, and uh, their payment processor software uh, exhibited double payments as a result of this bug. They later went bankrupt in 2001. Uh, their intellectual property was acquired by VeriSign, who then turned around and sold it to PayPal, uh, where it lives today. So let's think about why the set architecture didn't work. The big problem, probably the fundamental problem of the set architecture has to do with a subject of distributing public keys to all the people that need public keys in the protocol. This is called PKI, or public key infrastructure. And a nice way of thinking about this was actually developed by IKP, the IBM project that was one of the pre predecessors uh, to SET. What IKP did is they came up with three levels of security. In the most basic security, only the processor had to have a public key. Now, they had to have more than a public key. This public key had to be bound to their identity in something called a certificate. So we can think of these as certificates. On the second level of security, all the merchants also had to acquire uh, certificates. And in the third level of security, the highest level of security, not only did the processor and all the merchants have to have certificates, but they suggested that all users also have to go and acquire a certificate. Now, these certificates are used so that everybody in the protocol has signing keys. And essentially what happens is every time you do a transaction, everybody signs everything they do. And if there's disputes later, then there's a record of who said what about the transaction. Uh, so it's used to keep everybody accountable in the protocol. CyberCache always required level three. And when the standardization of SET came along, they decided that level three was, was the best level. Uh, this is a level where, as I mentioned, all users had to go and acquire certificates. Now, this was a disaster. Cert users don't want to go and acquire certificates. It's complicated. You have to deal with a certificate authority. Uh, in these days, it wasn't an automated process. You would have to uh, send enough information about who you are so that you could be granted uh, the certificates. And so that's a big reason why the set architecture failed. Some other points of interest about set. Uh, it was, as I mentioned, SET is not a system itself. It's an attempt at standardization. It was done in 1996. Around the same time, another group, the World Wide Web Consortium, were also looking at standardizing financial payments. They took a different approach. They thought it would be interesting to extend HTTP, the protocol, in sort of arbitrary ways. And they had a very general proposal for how you might extend it. And one of the use cases that they had was doing payments. Uh, this never happened. Uh, essentially, this uh, was never actually deployed. The whole extension framework uh, was never deployed. And so this was another standardization attempt that failed. Uh, at the time that we're recording this lecture in 2015, the W3C has already, has recently came out and said that they would like to do another attempt at standardizing uh, financial systems. And in this case, Bitcoin will be part of that standardization. However, given the past failures, they have a tough hill to climb. In the past portion of this lecture, we looked at credit-based systems. We'll now turn our attention to cash-based systems. 
Cash-based systems offer two advantages over credit-based systems. The first is they provide better anonymity. When you use a credit card-based system, the bank always knows what you're doing because the credit card is issued in your name. When you pay for something in cash, nobody necessarily knows who you are uh, when you purchase something. The other thing that cash can enable is offline transactions, where you don't have to uh, phone home to a third party in order to get the transaction approved. You can give someone cash and the transaction is done and everyone's satisfied. Maybe later they go to a third party like a bank to deposit the cash, but that third party doesn't need to be present in the transaction itself. Now these two requirements are sort of a more extreme version of what Bitcoin offers. In Bitcoin, it doesn't offer the same anonymity level as cash. In Bitcoin, it offers pseudonymity, uh, which means that some of your transactions could be tied together if you use the same Bitcoin addresses to originate transactions. Bitcoin also doesn't work in a fully offline way. It's true, what you could do is you could create a Bitcoin transaction, you could sign it, you could hand it to someone, maybe email it to them, but that person won't be content that that money won't be double spent until they see that it's incorporated in the blockchain. So unless if you uh, are online and able to broadcast that to the peer-to-peer -peer network, or alternatively, you really trust the person that you're receiving the money from, uh, Bitcoin operates in essentially an online fashion. The earliest ideas of applying cryptography to cash came from David Chom in 1983. To think about David Chom's proposal, let's start with uh, a sort of predecessor uh, to his actual proposal. So imagine that I handed you a $100 bill, and I also handed you a piece of paper, and the piece of paper was a contract, and it said that whoever comes back to you with this piece of paper, you'll give that $100 bill to them. Maybe you'll give them $99 to keep a cut for yourself. In any case, I want you to sign this paper saying that you will honor that arrangement. And then I'll take that paper with me and I'll give it to someone else. If I give it to someone else, then that paper is effectively worth $100. Now you might be thinking, what's the big deal? All you did is convert one small piece of paper worth $100, the bill, into a big piece of paper worth $100, which is the contract. But of course, this is a physical analogy of what you can do in a digital realm. We are able to do digital signatures, and so this contract could be a digital object. As long as people trust that the person who issued the contract is willing to honor the contract, then the system works. And effectively, this digital uh, contract is worth $100. Now, there is one problem, however. The problem is, once it's a digital contract, it's very easy to copy and paste those bits. So now you have two contracts. If each contract's worth $100, you just doubled your money to $200. If you send those two contracts to two different people, uh, this is called the double spending problem. And double spending is a problem that exists in all e-cash systems. All e-cash systems have to have some way of dealing uh, with double spending problem, including Bitcoin. So the first attempt at fixing the double spending problem is to encode a unique serial number uh, in each contract. This, doesn't, this is actually isn't sufficient to completely solve the problem, but it's a step in the right direction. Now the problem with the serial number is that remember one of the advantages of cash is that it's anonymous. But now if you have unique serial numbers, the bank knows who it issued this contract to and they can write down their name and they can write down the serial number uh, that, the, that the contract encoded and then they can trace this person as they spend the money. So David Chom came up with the digital equivalent of something called a blind signature and I'll explain it more in paper-based form. Uh, for a, to understand a blind signature, you could imagine that we take this contract, but in this case, instead of it being printed in normal ink, we print it in invisible ink. Okay? So the bank, we take it to the bank and we say, will you sign this contract? And they can't actually read uh, what is written because it's in invisible ink. So the ink is providing two properties. The first is, the obvious property, is that it hides the information that's in the contract. But the second property, which is equally important, is that whatever I've printed on that contract in invisible ink, I can't change it. It's locked in, it's fixed. And so if the bank decided to expose it to see what actually was written there, uh, then I, there's no way to change it, okay? So this is called the binding property. So this solution obviously solves the problem of the bank seeing your serial number. The bank doesn't see your serial number. However, it creates an even bigger problem, which is the bank doesn't see anything about the contract at all. It has no idea that it encodes the fact that it owes someone $100. The contract might encode the fact that it owes someone a million dollars. 
So the bank wants to be convinced that this contract is formed correctly, that the amounts are correct, but the paradox is it can't see the serial number. Now, one solution to this might be that only the serial number is printed in invisible ink and the rest of the contract is printed in regular ink. Uh, so everyone, so the bank is content, they can see what the amount is and the user is content because they maintain their privacy. The problem with this is at a cryptographic level, when we transition into digital signatures, we didn't, and at least in the early 80s, we didn't know how to do this. Blind signatures back then were all or nothing. Either you hid everything that was being signed or you hid none of it. And so we needed a different solution. So the question is, how can I convince you to sign something if you can't read it? And the answer is we can use what's called a cut and choose protocol. In this protocol, what I would do is I would create 100 contracts and hand them to you in a stack. What you would do is you would pick one at random from the stack and you would reveal the invisible ink. And when you reveal it, you can check that at least for that contract, yes, it did encode the fact that you owed $100 as opposed to a million dollars. Then you can pick a second contract out of the pile. You can reveal it and make sure it also says $100. You can keep doing it until there's one contract left, okay? When you have this one contract and you're holding it, even though you don't reveal the invisible ink, because the other 99 all said $100 and you chose them randomly, you're pretty sure that this one also encodes $100. And so you sign it, convinced to at least to a 99% probability that it actually says $100. So how does this help with the double spending problem? Well, the cut and choose protocol allows the bank to sign a contract, be convinced that it encodes the right amount, and yet not be able to see someone's serial number. So the idea is that you would get granted one of these contracts. Uh, when you wanted to do a transaction, you would give this contract to the person that you're, the merchant that you're buying the goods from. And then the merchant would turn around and give it back to the bank right away. So in Chom's earliest system, this was an online transaction system where you had to phone home to the bank every time you received one of these contracts. And we can stop calling them contracts, we can call them coins, because uh, that's a, another term for uh, what they actually are. And so when you spend a coin, uh, the merchant goes to the bank and they give it to the bank and they ask the bank, have you seen this coin before? Has it, been, has it come in before? Has this serial number been spent before? And if the bank says, no, it hasn't been spent before, then they honor the coin, uh, the contract component of the coin and they give the merchant the money that's owed. If the merchant goes to the bank and it has been double spent, then they can at least detect it. Now the problem is that if it is double spent, uh, there's no, you have no idea who the buyer is because it's an anonymous system. Uh, so that's a drawback that uh, people were, worked on later to, to address. Another drawback of this system is that once you spend a coin, you can't use it again. So it's not like an actual cash system where you mint coins, you hand it to the first person, they send it to a second person, and then the second person can give it to a third and a fourth, and you can have a whole bunch of chain, you can have a whole chain of transactions. Uh, and these type of system, every time you receive a transaction, you have to go back to the bank and essentially cash it in. Now the bank might issue a fresh coin, that's fine, but the point is that uh, these coins are only living for one transaction at a time. Now one proposal at fixing uh, the problem that the bank has to be online at all times came in 1988 uh, from Chom along with Fiat and Naor. What they observed is that if you want to prevent somebody from double spending a digital object, it's really hard. It might be impossible. There's no way to stop people from copying and pasting uh, digital, digital strings. However, they also noted that in traditional finance, we have this idea of checks, and the same problem arises. If I write you a check, you have no guarantee that the money's actually in my account. Maybe the money is in my account. I write you a check for $100. I have $100 in my account, but there's nothing stopping me from writing a second check to someone else for $100, uh, in which case, if both of you try and cash it, then uh, one of you won't be able to cash it. Uh, so in order to, to stop bad checks uh, from circulating, what the bank system uses is a detection system as opposed to a prevention system. They don't try and stop you from writing that second check, but what they do is when you write that second check, they are able to detect that it exists. They know who you are because you uh, have a bank account with the bank and they'll punish you through a penalty uh, for doing that. And so the idea of Chom, Fiat, and Naor is, is there some way to do that type of system in the digital realm? So if we go back to the idea that coins encode a unique serial number, uh, we can think about what this serial number looks like. 
if the serial number, if the bank maintains a, a mapping between customer names and serial numbers, then there's no anonymity in the system. Every time a coin comes back to the bank, they know who it was that spent it. And since the coin is coming from a merchant, they know where that user spent the money. Uh, in the original CHOM83 scheme, uh, the serial numbers were just random numbers. Okay, there was no link between the serial number and the bank. In fact, the bank couldn't even link them because of the blind signature. It hid the serial numbers in the coin, so the bank didn't even see the serial numbers. In this case, it offers full anonymity. Now, the question is, is there something in the middle between having no anonymity and full anonymity where we can allow partial traceability of coins, particularly in the case where they're double spent? So what Chom, uh, Fiat, and Aor came up with is the idea that every coin would include two serial numbers. These serial numbers would be arranged so that when you add them together, it actually forms the identity of the person who withdrew the cash. Now, this is a, a more general, uh, a more just general description of what this technique is: is secret sharing. Uh, so, in a secret sharing scheme, you have a secret and you split it up into n shares, you give it to n people, and you do it in such a way that if any m of the n, where m is some, less, some number less than n, as long as m people come together, then they can reconstruct what the secret is. So you can think of this as a two out of two secret sharing scheme, but any pos there's any possibility for n and m is also possible in the system. So the idea is you would still go to the bank as normal. You would give them a contract just like in the previous scheme. The only difference is that there would be two serial numbers. Now the bank would do the cut and choose. You would hand them 100 coins and they would open up 99 of them. And when they open the 99, they would check that those two numbers also add up uh, to your actual identity. So they're certain that in the contract they sign, the coin that they sign, that those two numbers will also add up uh, to your identity. So the idea is, uh, when I spend a coin, I give it uh, to the merchant, and these uh, serial numbers are still hidden. The merchant has no idea what the two serial numbers are, but what the merchant can do is they can ask me to reveal one or the other. You can think of it as the left serial number or the right serial number. So they might flip a coin and ask me to reveal it. So what happens if uh, I just spend the coin once, which is what we want to encourage, they only learn half of the secret. So they're either learning a random number or a random number minus my identity, which is also a random number uh, that's fully masked. And so it doesn't reveal any information about my identity. Now, if I double spend, if I send that same coin to a second merchant, there one of two things can happen. The second merchant will also go through the same protocol. They'll ask me to either reveal the left share or the right share. Assuming the first merchant asks for the left share, and if the second merchant also asks for the left left share, then what happens is my identity still isn't revealed. Okay? Now, when both of those merchants cash in their coins, the bank will detect that double spending occurred, uh, but they won't have any idea about who actually did it. However, 50% of the time, uh, the second merchant will ask for a different share than the first. So if the first asks for the left share, the second might ask for the right share. In this case, when they both cash in their coins at the bank, the bank sees that it's double spending. Because they have different shares, they can add those shares together. Now they know the identity of the person who did the double spending, and they can leverage some fee or punishment against that person. Now, 50% chance of catching double spending isn't that great. And so is there any way that we can boost this? So the idea of, uh, that Chomfiat and Neor had is instead of encoding one pair of numbers, what if we encode, say, 10? So for example, let's assume that they have a table, and here's my real name, and they assign a serial number to my name, 31337. And so here's a list of 10 numbers, 10 pairs of numbers. And if you do the mental arithmetic, you'll see that in each case, they add up uh, to this number. So what happens is when I spend a coin, uh, these numbers are originally hidden. And the merchant gets to go through the list, and they get to pick from each pair whether they want to see the left number or the right pair. But they do this for all 10 instead of just one single pair. So for example, the merchant might ask for the left, the left, the right, the left, and, and so on. Now, when I go to a second merchant, we do the same protocol. They're initially hidden, but the second merchant gets to also, for each pair, ask for either the left or the right. And what will happen with overwhelming probability is that at some point, uh, going through these pairs, the two merchants will ask for different shares. So for example, in the second row, and also in a lot of other rows in this uh, example, uh, if uh, they ask for the left share and the right share, and in that case, you can add together those two shares and reveal the identity of the person who spent the money. 
And so this works to boost the probability from one half to actually any number that you want. If you have n rows uh, or n pairs, then uh, the probability of getting caught is 1 minus uh, 2 to the minus n. And so it goes up to, for example, 99.999% if you use 20 pairs. Now, this doesn't solve the problem of being able to spend a coin more than once. Uh, once you spend your coin, the merchant still has to go back to the bank and they have to cash that coin in. And you can think about why. Why can't the merchant accept a transaction and then take that coin and turn around and spend it? Well, the answer is that that coin encodes the identity of the original spender. Okay, so if the merchant were able to respend that coin, then let's say they double spent it, then it would be the original person uh, who has issued the coin whose identity is encoded in that coin. Now, you might also think, is there some attack here where uh, I receive a coin and then I turn around and try and double spend it to falsely blame the person who gave it to me? But because I don't know what the other numbers are that are hidden, I only know the, the, the one path of opening up uh, the pairs, that's all I can do if I turn around and try and spend it myself. I can only open up the same pairs. Now, there's a couple ways we can improve this protocol. One thing is the efficiency is really bad. If we think about the idea of using 20 pairs of serial numbers, in that case, we have 40 serial numbers, okay, 20 pairs. But remember, when you go to the bank initially, you hand them, say, 100 coins, and they're going to open 99. Now, in that case, they have a 1% chance. You have a 1% chance of deceiving the bank, and that's probably too high. You probably want it a lot smaller than that. So you're more likely to go to the bank with 1,000 coins or 10,000 coins, and they're going to open all of them but one. And so if you think about serial numbers, 40 serial numbers on each coin, and then you're handing 1,000 coins, you're handing over 4,000 serial numbers to the bank. So this is a large uh, digital object uh, that you're giving to the bank uh, to audit. Uh, so what happened over the ensuing years is that a bunch of cryptographers look at this problem and sort of in parallel to this eCash systems being developed, there was some advancements in an area called zero knowledge proofs, which we're talking about in the earlier lecture uh, in this series when you talked about zero coin. Uh, in this case, uh, they slowly replace all these cut and choose with more compact zero knowledge proofs. So it's very easy. You just go to the bank, you hand them one contract, and then you prove in zero knowledge, for example, that encodes 100. Uh, and then you're done. You don't have to give them 100 coins, you just give them one, and the proof is very succinct and it's short. Uh, another area of research was th the idea of adding divisibility to the coins. So in Chom's original scheme, in, in uh, Chom, Fiat, and Naor, uh, if you got issued a coin that was worth $100 and you, went and bought, you wanted to buy something that was, say, only $75, there was no way to split that coin into 75 and 25. All you could do is go back to the bank, cash in that $100, and ask for a $75 coin and a $25 coin. Uh, so Okamoto and Ota, they had some interesting ideas. It used Merkle trees, which show up in Bitcoin, uh, to, to create a system that was uh, divisible, where you could actually subdivide uh, the coins that you were issued without involving the bank in the process. Now, Chom took his ideas and he commercialized them. He formed a company in 1989 called DigiCash. And this was probably the earliest uh, company that uh, dealt with online transactions or tried to solve the problem of online tra transactions. They had about a five-year head start on other companies like First Virtual and CyberCash that we talked about in the earlier lectures. Um, they, the actual cash in their system was called eCash, and they had another system uh, called CyberBucks. And there were a couple of banks that actually implemented them. There were a few in the US. There was at least one in Finland. In this case, in the eCash systems, because it uses Chom's protocols, clients are anonymous. So the bank uh, can't trace the money. When the money comes back, the coin comes back, it has a serial number, and the bank doesn't know uh, which user's uh, serial number that was issued to. However, the merchants aren't. The merchants, because they have to return coins as soon as they, they receive them, uh, the bank knows all, all the information about the merchants, how much money is coming in at what time, uh, et cetera. This is what the uh, screenshot looked of, like uh, from the software. And so you can see here there's a wallet, uh, and it shows you your balance. And then here's all the coins that you have uh, that have been issued uh, to you from the bank. And because you can't split coins, because there's no way to split them up, what the bank does is they issue you a whole set of coins in different denominations. So for example, you might get eight pennies, eight two cent coins, eight four cent coins, et cetera, et cetera, so that you can always sort of reconstruct uh, the right amount of change to pay for the exact amount of a transaction. 
uh, when you filled out a transaction, what would happen is you would browse to a website. So for example, this is to make a donation to Epic. And if you wanted to donate the money, uh, you would uh, click the link on the website. And what it would do is it would open a server connection back to your computer. And so your computer had to have uh, the full ability to be online and accept incoming server uh, connections. It had to be running HTTP and have a port open uh, to receive it. You had to have a full IP address. And if it was successful, the connection was successful, then your wallet service would launch on your computer and then you were able to approve the transaction and send the money. Now there were certain variants uh, to DigiCash that were, were pursued. Um, one thing that was sort of controversial about DigiCash is that the technology was patented, and specifically the blind signature scheme uh, that was used uh, had a patent filed on it. And so that stopped other people from developing uh, eCash systems that used the same protocol. Uh, there were a bunch of cryptographers that hung out on a mailing list called the Cypherpunks mailing list. This later transitioned into the cryptography mailing list, and you'll know the cryptography mailing list as the place where Satoshi originally posted the white paper and introduced Bitcoin. Uh, so, but before it tr made that transition, uh, the cypherpunks, they implemented a version of uh, eCash, of David's eCash, uh, that was called Magic Money. And Magic Money was only for experimental use, uh, so it did violate the patents, but because it was non-commercial, you could use it to experiment with. And it was sort of a fun piece of software to play with. The interface was all text-based. Um, you could send transactions by email. Uh, you would just copy and paste literally into email. Hopefully, you'd use a PGP key to protect uh, the transaction in transit, and you could email it uh, to another user. The other user would import it into a file on their computer, uh, which was called allcoins.dat, which sounds a little bit like wallet.dat, which is what Bitcoin uses to store its coins. Another proposal by uh, Ben Lurie with contributions from lots of other people is called Lucra. And in this scheme, what they did is they targeted the blind signature scheme and they tried to come up with an alternative uh, which wouldn't be covered by the patent. And then you can keep rest, the rest of the system largely the same. Another problem that's interesting that arises uh, when you use DigiCash is, uh, as we mentioned, you can't make change. And so if you need to make change, you have to go back to the bank and you have to get the bank uh, to reissue the right set of coins so that you can make exact change uh, for something. Ian Goldberg had the idea that maybe the merchant could send you coins back uh, if they had some coins uh, so that uh, you might overpay for the item, but then you would get some coins back. However, this introduces a problem with anonymity. Remember, in eCash, the senders are anonymous. However, the merchants aren't. And when the merchant sends cash back, technically they're the sender, so they're anonymous, and you, as the person who has to turn this cash into the bank, are not anonymous. And so there's no way to do that system without breaking the anonymity of the original user trying to buy the goods. And so he had uh, a different proposal where there were different types of coins uh, that would allow these transactions to occur, allow you to get change back, and preserve the anonymity of the user. Now, why did DigiCash fail? The main problem with DigiCash is it was hard to persuade you know, the banks and the merchants to adopt it. Uh, people didn't want to use it, and because no merchants or not a lot of merchants were using it to accept money, then users didn't want to use it either. Uh, it also didn't support user-to-user use, user -user transactions, at least it didn't support them very well. Um, it was really centered on the user-to-merchant uh, transaction. And so if merchants weren't on board with the system, uh, then there was no way to really bootstrap interest in the system. As a note, a side note, Bitcoin, uh, because it allows both user-to-merchant and user-to-user -user transaction, uh, Bitcoin probably part of its success could be attributed to the fact that it supported user-to-user -user transactions. So there was something to do with your Bitcoin, at least send it to other users, uh, while the community tried to drum up support for Bitcoin and get merchants to accept it. So at the end of the day, DigiCash lost and the credit card companies won. In the later years of the company, DigiCash also experimented with tamper-proof hardware or tamper-resistant hardware. Uh, in this case, they had devices. They might be a small device that was usually called a wallet or it might be some sort of card. And what they were trying to solve is this double spending problem. And in this case, they weren't trying to just merely detect the existence of double spending. They were trying to actually prevent it. 
So in this hardware, there might be a counter that encodes your balance, and every time you spend money, uh, the counter decreases. If you load the, the card with more money, then the counter goes up. But the point is, there's no way to physically or digitally go in and tamper with that counter. So if that counter goes to zero, then that card stops being able to spend money. Now, there were a bunch of companies that looked at uh, this uh, tamper-resistant hardware in addition to Digicash. Uh, Digicash worked later with a company uh, called Cafe, which was based in Europe. Uh, there was also another company formed called Mondex that was later acquired by MasterCard. And Visa had their own variant called Visa Cash. So this is the Mondex system. Uh, Mondex consisted of a card. Uh, this is a smart card with a chip. And there were also these wallet units. And you could load either of them with cash. So you can get the cards, and they would have some amount of cash on them. And you can have wallets that would also have cash on them. And if you wanted to do a user-to-user -user swap of money, what would happen is the first user would put their card into the wallet. You could move money off of the, the card onto the wallet. Then you'd stick the second card in the wallet, and you move the money off the wallet onto the second card. And so you could exchange cash uh, in that way, and it was uh, anonymous. Now, Mondex actually trialed uh, their technology in a bunch of communities. One community is actually uh, a city very close to where I grew up uh, in Guelph, Ontario. And needless to say, because it doesn't exist today, this technology, you know what the, the end of the story is, which is it didn't really catch on. And the main problem with it is that uh, cards, Mondex cards, they're like cash. If you lose them or they get stolen, the money's gone. And if there was some sort of malfunction with the card, if the card reader wouldn't read it, there's no way to determine whether that card had balance on it or not. And so Mondex, typically what they would do in these scenarios is they would incur the cost. They would assume that, uh, that the card was loaded and then they would uh, re-enumerate the user uh, for that, that lost money. But that cost the company a lot of money. Uh, the wallet itself was also, it was sort of a larger form factor. Uh, it was slow in order to process. It was much faster to pay uh, with credit card or with cash. And retailers hated having a bunch of these terminals. They just wanted to have one terminal for uh, your Visa card, and they didn't want to have two different terminals. Um, so for all of these reasons, the Mondex uh, experiment was not successful. However, what was successful is if you remember these cards, we have these small chips on them. And so this is a smart card technology. Today, in a lot of countries, including Canada, where I live, Every single credit card and every single debit card now has this technology on it. They all are based on uh, smart cards. It's used for a different purpose. It's not used to prevent double spending. It's used for authentication. So you prove that you know the PIN that's associated with your account. But this technology was adopted, and Mondex was using it long before uh, the wider banking industry made it a standard for bank-issued cards. In this portion of the lecture, we'll look at where eCash gets its value from. We didn't cover this in the previous portion when we talked about different eCash systems. And the reality is that there's a bunch of different proposals for how you do this, and different companies do it differently. In the very early portion of this lecture, we looked at credit card-based systems. And so in this case, it's obvious that the user's credit card is getting billed every time they conduct a transaction. In the case of DigiCash, we have these digital cash objects uh, and they might be worth $100, but what makes them actually worth $100? The answer is that in order to be issued DigiCash that's worth $100, you would have to take $100 out of your bank account and give it uh, to the bank that was issuing you the DigiCash. Some other maybe more far-fetched ideas was what if the government actually authorized services to mint money? They were actually authorized by the mint of a particular country in order to create new cash out of the thin air. That was the idea behind net cash. Another proposal thought that what if we took a pile of gold and we put it in a vault and we only issued digital cash that was of the same value of the gold that was in the vault? Uh, so eGold used this. There was another company called DigiGold. They weren't fully backed by gold, but they at least had partial reserves for the amount of digital cash that they issued uh, that was backed by gold. So in a digital realm, how do you create something that has value out of thin air, especially when digital bits can be copied and pasted? The idea is to create something that's scarce. Uh, scarcity uh, is one of the features of all, not just cash, but other things that have been used like gold or diamonds uh, as substitutes for cash. Uh, one way to achieve scarcity in cryptography is to look at the solutions to a moderately hard puzzle or uh, the output of a moderately hard function. 
So a moderately hard function is a function that takes some amount of time, computational resources, maybe memory, uh, in order to compute the output of. Um, in this case, by moderate, we mean like it might take, you know, for example, in, in Bitcoin, you know that uh, the entire peer-to-peer -peer network, it takes them about 10 minutes to solve a block. That's the idea of a moderately hard function. It takes a significant amount of time, but it's also not completely infeasible, as would be the case if you were trying to recover someone's private key from their public key in the signature scheme that Bitcoin uses. So the idea of uh, applying moderately hard puzzles to solving cache-like uh, systems, uh, cache-like problems, uh, was first proposed by Dwork and Naor, uh, and they looked at email spam. And so their idea was, what if every time you spend an email, you would have to compute the solution to some moderately hard puzzle? Uh, for the average user, it wouldn't be that much of a, a barrier to sending emails because you're not sending emails very frequently. But if you're a spammer and you're trying to send out thousands or millions of emails all at once, then that cost would become prohibitive once you multiply it by the thousand or hundred uh, or million emails that you're trying to send. This idea was later uh, actually implemented and sort of independently discovered by Adam Back in a proposal called HashCash. Now, proof of work or moderately hard puzzles, uh, they also can be used uh, just to slow things down. So if you have some function and you want to delay the amount of time that it takes, think about the creation of blocks in the blockchain in Bitcoin, uh, you can also apply it uh, to this uh, problem as well. So Hashcash, as mentioned, was proposed by back in 97. And it was the same idea, which is that if you're an emailer, or you can think of it as a more general, at a general level, if you are the consumer of some resource, then in order to consume that resource or send an email, you would have to generate the solution to one of these moderately hard puzzles, or they're also known as proof of work protocols. So the specific puzzle that Hashcash uses, uh, which will look familiar to you having looked at Bitcoin, uh, is what happens is you're given a hash function and you're given some string. Uh, and we'll talk about what's in this string. But the idea is you have a nonce value and you can choose any value you want. Uh, so the easiest thing would be to set it equal to zero, like a counter, and then step through. And so what you would do is you would hash this string together with your chosen nonce, say zero, and you would look at the output. Now the output will, have, will be random looking and just by chance, it will have a certain number of leading zeros. Maybe it has none, it, you know, the output happens to start with a one, maybe you get two or three leading zeros. And the idea is that you would change this nonce value and you would keep computing this hash until you happen to find some nonce value that satisfies an output where there's m leading zeros, where m could be a number like 20 or 40. Now, what's inside the string that you're hashing? that ties it back into the email system that we're trying to do. So the first thing is there's some name that describes the service that you're going to use this hash cache to spend on. And what this does is it just means that this cache can only be spent consuming that service. Okay, so if you generate one coin, you can't use it to both send email and you know, download a file with it. Another thing is uh, validity period. So Hashcash has the problem of double spending like all eCash systems, and it solves it the same way as everyone else does, which is the person that's receiving the Hashcash, they just keep a list of all the Hashcash they've seen, and they check it to see if someone spends it twice. Okay? Now, this list would get really long over time, and so if you put a validity period into the Hashcash, say that Hashcash lasts three months, then your list, you can at least shorten it. As soon as Hashcash that you've seen that expired, uh, a month ago, you can purge it from your list and you can end up with a shorter list. Another thing, another alternative if you don't want to maintain a list is if you have an interactive protocol where the person that you're giving the hash cache to is online when you're ready to deliver or consume the resource, then what that person can do is they can send you a challenge. And if they send you a challenge, you can incorporate it in your proof of work. And now that proof of work or that hash cache is specific to that person. That person gave you the challenge. They know that it's not a double spend because uh, they choose random challenges every time they ask uh, for hash cache. The final alternative is if you uh, are not in the interactive setting, if you're just generating hash cache yourself, it could be that a spammer still uh, is able to send a million emails just by spending a really long time uh, computing hash cache for all the emails that they want to spend. And so one thing you can do is you can prove that your hash cache is fresh, that it was freshly generated. It wasn't generated 
uh, before some period in the past. And the way you can do this is with a beacon. A beacon is just a fancy way of saying some source of unpredictable randomness. Uh, so in the Hashcash proposal, they thought about lottery tickets. You could use the lottery numbers of a certain day, and if that was involved in the creation of this Hashcash, you know that the person started computing the Hashcash after those lottery numbers were released. Uh, you could also use stock market prices, or you could use the cover of the Times of London uh, because no one could predict what the story would be on a particular day, at least not uh, before, say, a day before that newspaper was published. Now, you might recognize a beacon from Bitcoin uh, because in Bitcoin, what Satoshi did is in the very first block, the Genesis block, he incorporated a newspaper article that proved that he didn't start minting, or sorry, he didn't start uh, working on the blockchain until after the date that that newspaper was published. Okay, so this could prevent some sort of far-fetched attack, but maybe where he pre-computed a huge blockchain, and then as other people came into the Bitcoin network and started competing with him to solving blocks, uh, if someone else solved the block, he could just drop two or three blocks because he had this long pre-computed chain. Okay, so he proved that he didn't actually do this attack by incorporating a beacon into the Genesis block. Let's compare and contrast uh, Hashcash with Bitcoin. Now, the problem uh, with uh, Hashcash is that the granularity of the proof of work or moderately hard puzzle is very coarse. Essentially, all you can do is you can increase the number of zeros that are required at the output of the hash function, or you can decrease them. What this effectively does is double how hard the problem is, or you can scale it back and have the problem as well. So we know from Bitcoin that the blockchain, you want to solve blocks on average, the whole network uh, wants to solve them in about a 10 minute interval. So let's say that for some reason the network got really fast and they started solving blocks on average uh, in eight minutes instead of 10 minutes. And so you want to make the problem a little more hard. Now, if Bitcoin used hash caches proof of work, then uh, they could only double it. Uh, so it would go from eight minutes to 16 minutes, and then that's way too long. And so what we want is a finer grain precision where we can make it harder so that it, something that's taking eight minutes can take exactly 10 minutes. So Satoshi observed that there's a way of thinking about the Hashcash proposal uh, for proof of work that's, that's equivalent but looks at it slightly different. If you think about an output that has a whole bunch of leading zeros, well, any number with a huge number of leading zeros is actually just a small number. That's another way of thinking about it. Small numbers are numbers that have a lot of uh, leading zeros. And so what you can think of it as uh, equivalently is you're hashing this thing until you get a number that's smaller than some upper bound. Okay, and in Hashcash, because they're selecting bits, uh, that upper bound has to be a perfect power of two, but there's no reason that it has to be a perfect power of two. It could be any number that you want. You can just pick a number and say, keep hashing until it's less than this number. And so with that tweak, uh, Satoshi proposed that that number just be uh, any integer. Uh, it's called the target. And the proof of work that Bitcoin uses is very similar to Hashcash, but with this twist that you're trying to generate a, a number, an output of your hash that's less than this particular number. Now, another proposal for how to mint uh, coins using proof of work comes from Rivest and Shamir in 97. Uh, these are the R and the S in the RSA crypto system, respectively. And they observed that with Hashcash style minting, uh, what happens is when you solve say you create one coin, if you want to solve uh, the proof of work to create a second coin, a third coin, it takes you the same amount of work every time you want to do it. Now for Reves and Shamir, unlike a hash cache where users themselves are generating uh, their own hash cache, Reves and Shamir were interested in what if a government decided that they wanted to mint money instead. And if you think about how anti-counterfeiting works just in say paper currency, uh, in order to counterfeit a bill, there's a huge initial cost. You have to acquire all the equipment to mimic the security features that are on, uh, on the bills. But once you have all that equipment, then you can print, it doesn't matter if you print one bill or you print 100 bills, uh, your costs go down. So it has a huge fixed overhead cost, but it has a low marginal cost. And so they were interested in whether you could do a proof of work scheme that would mimic these properties, where it would cost a real lot to mint that first coin, but once you had the computational abilities to mint that first coin, then minting a second, third, and fourth coin became uh, a lot cheaper. And so they had a proposal, it was also based on hash functions. In this case, it was based on finding collisions as opposed to pre-images. We won't go through the details of their scheme, but it was interesting at a high level, uh, the problem that they were trying to solve. 
Another extension of Hashcash uh, comes from Hal Finney. And what Hal didn't like about uh, Hashcash is that once you create a unit of Hashcash, you spend some computational resources creating it, you spend it, but then you have to retire that coin uh, to prevent double spending. You have to check uh, that that coin doesn't get spent again. There's no way that once you mint a piece of Hashcash, it can be passed around from person to person. Uh, so he thought, well, what if I set up a server and every time you spend a hash cash, uh, you can a piece of hash cash, you can send it to the server and the server will sort of refresh that coin. It won't refresh it by computing a new proof of work. It will just refresh it because you trust the server uh, to only refresh coins that it receives and not create new coins out of thin air. And then to provide a layer of security, uh, what he did is he based this server uh, using a trusted platform module or a TPM, which is a little chip where you can uh, create programs and you can actually remotely over the internet check and see that that computer is running exactly the program that was specified. Uh, so he set up a server that used this remote attestation uh, so you could check that this refreshing service wasn't creating its own new coins, it was just refreshing existing Hashcash. Now let's think about the differences between Hashcash and Bitcoin. So as we mentioned, Bitcoin effectively uses Hashcash's proof of work. Uh, but it modifies it slightly. Instead of uh, shooting for a number that's smaller than a perfect power of two, it's any number. But that's just a slight modification. Uh, the more substantial difference is a little more subtle. In Bitcoin, the proof of work is being used for a different purpose than minting coins. You're not solving the proof of work in order to mint coins. Now you might be saying, wait a minute, that's, that's not right. We have these miners, and miners, we call them miners because they're minting new coins. And all miners do is solve proof of work, right? So obviously the proof of work is being solved in order to mine new coins or mint new coins. However, there's a subtle distinction here that needs to be made. The best way to think about this is maybe think about what happens to Bitcoin after all 21 million Bitcoins are created. What happens is the miners, the so-called miners, they continue solving the proof of work even though they're not getting any new money. Okay, so they're not actually solving the proof of work to, to generate new money, they're doing something else to solve the proof of work. Uh, specifically, what they're doing is they're solving the proof of work to add blocks to the blockchain. Okay, now the, the mechanism for minting new coins piggybacks on that system, where if you create a new block, we'll also insert new coins into that block, at least for a certain time period uh, that Bitcoin runs over. Uh, but it's not the idea of Hashcash where any individual can fire up their computer and directly mint coins by solving a proof of work system. Bitcoin also differs from Hashcash in the sense that Bitcoin has a lot more to it than Hashcash does. In Hashcash, it's a simple system where you just mint a coin, you send it to someone else. In Bitcoin, you have a distributed peer-to-peer -peer network, you have the blockchain with a ledger, you have transactions which have very complicated transaction types. So I only belabor this point because you know, there is this notion that, for example, in the words of Adam Back, who invented uh, Hashcash, he says that Bitcoin is Hashcash extended with inflation control. I think that's overreaching a bit. It's sort of like saying a Tesla is just a battery that has transportability. So why did Hashcash never catch on? Uh, the, probably the issue is that spam just wasn't a big enough problem to solve. For a lot of people, they view spam as a nuisance, but it's not something that they want to spend their computing cycles on uh, combating. Uh, we have spam filters today, and they work pretty well at keeping spam out of our inboxes. It's also possible that it wouldn't actually prevent spammers. Uh, in particular, if spammers had a botnet where they took control of a large number of other people's computers, then they could use those computers to harvest Hashcash, and then they could continue spamming us. Uh, however, that said, the idea of using proof of work to, to limit resources, it's still an idea that's kicking around. You can see it in some uh, proposals for replacing network protocols, uh, for example, minimal LT. In this uh, portion of the lecture, we'll look at a few systems that also combine proof of work with developing a cryptocurrency, but they introduce a third component, which is timestamping. Timestamping, uh, there's a bunch of proposals, but the earliest goes back to Harbor and Stornetta in 1991, and they, they sort of uh, finesse their ideas in the ensuing years. And this, what I'll explain now, is sort of the, the latter uh, version of it. But in their timestamping scheme, timestamping is actually a bit of a misnomer. Uh, the idea isn't that you have some object and you're going to say conclusively that it 
came into existence at a particular time. But what it's going to do is it's going to try and give you a sense of, uh, a sort of fuzzy sense of when it came into existence. And it's also going to be order preserving. So if one element is introduced after another element, that partial ordering is preserved and it's uh, undisputable. So their idea is if you have a bunch of information data of any sort, uh, you can think of them visually as these blocks, uh, what they'll do is they'll define certain regions of times or intervals. Uh, so this might be every 10 minutes, for example. And so uh, in the first 10 minutes, they spend some time collecting all the information. And then when the interval is up, uh, what they do is they take that information and they use a Merkle tree to combine all the information into a single node that represents all the information. Okay. Then when the second 10 minutes are up and they've collected all their objects, they do the same thing. Uh, they collect all of them and they aggregate them into a single, into a single value using a Merkle tree. And they tie the node in the second interval to the node in the first interval by hashing in uh, this representative node as well as the whole tree. Then as time continues, more blocks come in and they continue to do this and they build up this chain. Now this data structure should look extremely familiar to you because it's essentially the blockchain, okay? Uh, blockchain also, you have blocks and they're aggregated, the transactions are aggregated using a Merkle tree and every block is tied to the previous block uh, using a hash chain. Uh, the idea of Stornetta and Harbor is, let's say everybody observes this block at a particular time once they observe that block, they may sign it to say that, yes, I saw it, and I saw it at this particular time. Uh, and once you uh, observe this block, then everything that happened before is sort of fixed. You can't go back and you can't change the ordering of any of the events that occurred before. So you don't have to pay attention to all of these blocks as, as they come in, but the idea is that occasionally you check in, you grab the latest value, and when you grab it, it sort of fix, it fixes all the stuff that uh, existed before it. So let's compare and contrast this time stamping service, which looks a lot like the blockchain in Bitcoin with the blockchain itself. So the first difference is that in a time stamping, or the only difference, is that the time stamping service, the intervals are set by some party and you trust them. So if they're gonna define the intervals every 10 minutes, nothing's enforcing that they actually occur every 10 minutes. Satoshi's idea was, what if we take a proof of work, a proof of work you can use to delay delay things, and so what if you apply it to delaying the creation of these new uh, entities in the hash chain? If you can delay it and you set the proof of work so it takes about 10 minutes, then you can actually enforce in a trustless manner the fact that these intervals last roughly 10 minutes. Uh, the nice idea, the really nice idea, uh, is that if you take the hash cache proposal for proof of work, uh, or Satoshi's slight modification of it, and you drop it in as the hash function that's hashing uh, all the blocks in the Merkle tree as well as the previous block in the hash chain, if you drop it in, it just works, right? They're both based on hashes, and so you can just drop it in. It preserves all the properties you need from a hash chain and a hash tree, plus it gives you the proof of work, which slows things down so that you can only add on intervals that are set by the difficulty of this problem. Now, in the time stamping service, we also mentioned that observers observe these blocks and they sign off on them. In Bitcoin, you don't need that. You don't need signatures. You don't need people paying attention because the blockchain is difficult to create. By looking at the blockchain, you can just look for the longest chain. The longest chain is the one that reflects the most amount of work and you trust it because the work was put into it, not because a bunch of people said, I saw this at a particular time. Now the bonus of using the blockchain is it also gives you a really nice way of minting cash. If you wanna mint new Bitcoins, you can update uh, when you update the blockchain, you can include a transaction, a Coinbase transaction that creates these new Bitcoins out of thin air. And because these intervals are set for every 10 minutes, then you have a controlled mechanism for creating these currencies at regular intervals. Now, another proposal that looked at combining proof of work, time stamping with applications to eCash is called B Money uh, from Wei Dai in 1980, 1998. In this proposal, you have a peer-to-peer -peer network, sort of like in Bitcoin, and they're observers, and the point is that they all maintain a ledger, but they each have, there's no global ledger like in the blockchain. They each have their own ledger of what they think everyone's balance is. Uh, what happens is if I wanna create a new coin, I choose a proof of work, and it's not really specified what this would be, but I just solve some proof of work, I generate the solution, and then that's my coin. 
when I have the coin, I broadcast it to all the observers, and all the observers say that my account goes up by some amount based on how much work I put into minting this coin. Then if I want to transfer the money from someone to someone else, then I do something very similar to Bitcoin where I say who I am, I say what coin I want to transfer, and I sign it with a secret key that is tied to my identity uh, so everyone knows that this transaction uh, came from me, and I broadcast that to the network. Then people validate the signature, the observers validate it, and they update their ledger, uh, moving the money from my account uh, to another account. Another proposal, an academic proposal, came in 1999. And in this case, uh, it also used a ledger-based uh, system. It used a Merkle tree. Instead of the structure where you have Merkle trees that tie into a hash chain, they just had a huge Merkle tree. So you make a Merkle tree that represented each day. And once you had two days, you would, you would create a node above it that represented weeks. And once you've run it for more than one week, then you would create one for months, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, so despite the differences in the structure, the properties are basically the same. Uh, what would happen is uh, the ledger would track uh, coins as they're created. So this is different from both B-Money and from Bitcoin in the sense that we're not using this ledger to, tra to track transactions themselves. Okay? The transactions still happen in some fashion that's offline from the ledger. All this ledger is keeping track of is what coins were issued with what serial numbers to prevent things like double spending. Uh, but they have some additional proofs using zero knowledge so that, that you can't trace uh, coins as they're spent. Another similar proposal comes from Nick Sasbo. Uh, he proposed a system called Bitgold. And according to him, he had the idea for Bitgold as early as 1998. However, he didn't get around to blogging about it until 2005. Now, the reason these dates are maybe a little interesting is that there's a minor conspiracy theory that's uh, popu popularized by Nathaniel Popper, who works uh, as a New York Times reporter and also wrote a book on the history of Bitcoin, a very good book. Uh, aside from this particular issue, uh, where he notes that the blog post timestamps changed after Bitcoin was released uh, so that the, beam, the Bitgold uh, proposal looks like it was uh, written up about two months after Bitcoin was released. Popper's hypothesis is that Sasbo is a leading contender, if not Satoshi Nakamoto himself, and he cites this as evidence of uh, Sasbo as Satoshi trying to cover up the fact that he invented uh, Bitgold uh, before uh, he knew about, about Bitcoin. Now, the problem with this is I'll explain how Bitcoin works and you can decide for yourself if it's that similar to Bitcoin or not. Uh, the other problem is if you actually read the contents of the blog post, uh, Nick is very clear about him having this idea in 1998 and he doesn't try and change those dates. So a more reasonable explanation is that maybe he just bumped uh, the posts to the top of his blog after Bitcoin just to popularize the idea and make sure that people were aware of his similar proposal that existed prior to it. Uh, anyways, let's take a look at the proposal itself. So in this proposal, it starts off very similar to B-Money or Hashcash. You have a user, Alice, and she takes a challenge string. She computes a moderately hard proof of work function on it uh, to create a solution. Now, where does this challenge string come from? Well, there was somebody who created uh, currency before her. And so what she does is she uses their solution in order to form her challenge. And after she creates her solution, someone else will come along and they'll take her solution and they'll use it as a challenge for themselves. Uh, so all these coins are tied together uh, through a chaining of the proof of works. Once she has a solution, she broadcasts it to a network of timestamping servers. So this is a peer-to-peer -peer network of servers that, that do timestamping. And probably it was originally envisioned when uh, timestamping services were available, uh, where companies would actually run these services where you could send them documents and they would sign off uh, saying what time uh, certain things were observed. So what you do is you take your solution, you combine it with your identity and a public key, uh, and you assert what time you created the solution at, and you get all these time servers to sign off saying that they did observe it at roughly that uh, amount of time. Once you have this object created, uh, you can take it and combine it with the original challenge that was used to create the solution, and you can broadcast that to a different network of servers. It could be the same network or it could be a different uh, network. And this network maintains what's called a, a secure title registry. And so what they'll do is they'll take this tuple and they'll store it uh, for future work. And if anyone comes along and wants to see uh, you know, this, this coin, they'll pull it out and they'll show that it was created at a certain time and it was signed by a bunch of timestamping services. Now let's say that Alice wants to transfer this money to Bob. 
what she does is she gets Bob's identification in his public key and she creates a second type of transaction and she specifies her original transaction. She asserts that she wants to move this transaction from her identity to Bob's identity. Uh, she lists Bob's public key and she signs it with her private key that corresponds to the public key uh, that was incorporated in the original transaction. And so this is what stops anybody from transferring the money other than Alice uh, from Alice's account. Then she broadcasts this transaction to the network and the network records it and the whole system continues. Now smart contracts is something else that was pioneered by SASBO that Bitcoin touches on and other altcoins like Ethereum uh, take to, to a larger extent. Uh, smart contracts, you know, Nick never really wrote uh, directly about how smart contracts would work in Bitgold. He did write in general about how they might work with the secure title registry, which is the primitive that Bitgold uses to keep track of all the transactions. Uh, but in any case, uh, he did a lot of writing on that aspect of digital cash as well. In, in both B Money and Bitgold, uh, proof of work is used to directly mint currency. Anybody can solve a proof of work and the solution is money itself. In the Bitcoin, uh, the solution to a proof of work isn't money itself. It's a block that extends the blockchain. Uh, so proof of work is used to update a blockchain instead. It's not used directly to mint uh, coins and you'll continue to do the proof of work well after you're done minting all the coins that will exist in Bitcoin. B money and Bitcoin or Bitgold rather uh, rely on time stamping services. So they rely on basically trusting that certain people see things at certain time and they sign off on it. In Bitcoin, you actually don't really care about what time certain things were created. All you care about is the relative order that certain blocks were created after other blocks. And the reason that you can trust that a particular blockchain that you see is an accurate one is, amount, is based on the amount of work that went into creating it. Because it takes a lot of work to create the blockchain, that's what makes you trust it, not because it was signed by a bunch of entities that assert that certain things happen at certain times. So in Bitcoin, it's a really simple solution where you can just look at the blockchain and use the longest chain. Finally, uh, when you think about uh, the entities that make up uh, the peer-to-peer -peer networks and B-Money and Bitgold, uh, if these entities start disagreeing about things that you see, you're going to basically decide what the ground truth is by counting who says what, by basically taking a vote amongst these entities. But since anybody can become an entity and entities might hide behind 100 identities, then uh, it's really hard and not very reliable uh, to, to do these type of mechanisms. In Bitcoin, because they apply the proof of work to the blockchain as opposed to uh, relying on time stampers uh, to, to, to assert that certain things happen at certain times, then what you can do in Bitcoin instead is you can, you can count the work that went into the creation of something as assertion of its validity rather than relying on what uh, a certain number of people uh, say. So in other words, you're counting the amount of computational power that's backing some version of events as opposed to, as opposed to relying on the number of identities asserting that a certain uh, order of events occurred. B money and Bitcoin never uh, took off. Um, both of them were just proposed in, uh, in B money's case, it was on a mailing list. In Bitcoin, it was across a series of blog posts. Neither of them were implemented uh, directly. And because they were blog posts and not full specifications, not as detailed as, for example, the Bitcoin white paper, and there was no code uh, to go along with it, uh, the blog posts sort of gloss over a couple issues uh, that may be solvable, may not be solvable. Um, but what happens when people disagree about version of events is something that's not uh, explained very well or in a convincing manner. I note that B-Money doesn't really explain it at all. Bitgold does refer to some academic literature on how you solve uh, problems. Uh, so it's a little more convincing, uh, but there's nothing like a full uh, rationale and ex explanation of how it's going to resolve conflicts. Uh, the second is that uh, once you solve a proof of work and you broadcast it, someone else might try and steal it and then it's a foot race to see who gets to register it first. That could probably be solved by incorporating into the challenge the identity of the person uh, who's creating the coins, but that's not explicitly mentioned. Uh, a third problem is determining how hard uh, the proof of work should be when you mint the coins and how much that amount of proof of work is, is actually worth. So in B money, uh, every bit, every piece of uh, currency that's created and in, in Bitgold as well, it may have a completely different value depending on how 
hard a particular moderately hard function was at a given time given the computational advancements. What Bitcoin does instead is it adjusts the difficulty as the network gets faster or it scales it back and it keeps everything uniform. So every, every Bitcoin is worth or a fraction of Bitcoin is worth the same amount. Uh, whereas that's not guaranteed in B money or Bitgold. Different coins could be worth different amounts depending on the functions that were used to create them. In this final portion of the lecture, we'll look about what, if anything, we can determine about Satoshi Nakamoto himself and also uh, the, the ideas that he had in the design of Bitcoin by looking at the history of the ideas that, that uh, led up to the invention of Bitcoin. So first off, just as a refresher, who is Satoshi Nakamoto? A lot of people know him as the creator of Bitcoin, and that's sort of an abstract notion. Okay, we can be a little more specific about what was done in the name of Satoshi Nakamoto. So according to Satoshi Nakamoto, and I'll note as an aside that when Satoshi asserts that something is true, I'm going to take him at his word. Okay, I don't think just because he's anonymous, there's a reason that he's going to lie about certain things. So if he says that I started coding Bitcoin in May 2007, let's, let's believe him uh, and believe that that's true. So if, at least according to him, uh, around May 2007 is when he started coding Bitcoin. Uh, he registered the domain bitcoin.org in August 2008. Uh, and at that time, he started sending private emails to a few people who were, uh, he thought might be interested in the proposal. Okay. Then uh, a little later in October 2008, he released publicly a white paper that described the protocol and then soon after he released the code uh, for it as well. Then he s stuck around for about two years. And over these ensuing two years, he uh, posted lots of messages on message forums. He emailed with lots of people. He responded to people's concerns. On the code side, he submitted patches uh, to the code. He fixed it up in conjunction with other developers and basically maintained uh, the source code. Uh, in December 2010, he then left the project. Now, I'm referring to Satoshi Nakamoto as a he. I have no reason to believe that he's a he as opposed to a she. It's just since he assumed a, a, a male name, it's the easiest pronoun uh, to use. Another thing I'm doing is I'm referring to him as a single individual. There is a theory that maybe Satoshi Nakamoto is a collection of individuals. I don't buy this theory. I think that he is probably an individual. The reason why is if we think about what was done in the name of Satoshi Nakamoto, if we start at the end and we think about the two years somebody spent replying to emails and patching code, it would be really hard to think that this would be multiple people sharing user accounts and passwords and you know, responding in similar style, uh, a similar voice, and making sure they didn't contradict each other. It just seems a much simpler explanation that at least this portion of what Satoshi did was done by a single, by a single uh, individual. Now, if you look at what he writes and what he says and the, the patches that he makes to the code, it's clear that he understood whoever the single individual is, that individual did understand the full code base of Bitcoin. And so it's very reasonable that they're also the person that created the original piece of Bitcoin software. Okay? It's also clear from their writings that they understood all the design aspects of Bitcoin. And so uh, they're probably uh, the person who wrote the white paper as well. There's no reason to assume otherwise. Now, all of this isn't to say that Satoshi didn't have help with the original design. However, we know that Satoshi is very quick to attribute any help he receives after Bitcoin is released to the people that uh, contributed to the project. And there's no reason to think that he would lie about inventing something by himself when he actually had help uh, from other individuals. Now, we might ask ourselves, what did Satoshi know about the history of eCash? And to understand this better, we can look at what he cites in his white paper and also the references that existed on early versions of the Bitcoin website. So if we look at his white paper, we see that he cites some papers on basic cryptography and probability theory. He also cites the time stamping work uh, that we saw in uh, the previous slides. And uh, it's very natural to think that he based the design of the blockchain on these references since the similarities are uh, so apparent. He also cites the hash cache uh, proposal, which has a proof of work that's very similar to the one that's used in Bitcoin, and he has a reference to B money. Later on the website, he added references to Bitgold and as well to Halfini's reusable proof of work schemes. Now, if we look at the history of uh, email transactions that were made by 
were made public by people who corresponded with Satoshi Nakamoto in the early days, we see that the B money proposal was actually added after the fact uh, at the suggestion of Adam Back. Uh, Satoshi then emailed Wei Dai, who created B money, and apparently Wei Dai was the one that, that told him about Nick's uh, proposal about Bit Gold. Okay, so these proposals weren't probably inspirations for the original design. Uh, he later corresponded a lot with Hal Finney, and that's quite a reasonable explanation for why he cites reusable proof of works, at least on the website. Uh, so based on just the citations in the white paper, it seems reasonable that maybe the only things that he knew or thought were relevant about uh, the history of eCash was Hashcash and the time stamping proposals. In the early days of Bitcoin, Bitcoin had a Wikipedia article, and at some point it was flagged for deletion uh, by the moderators of Wikipedia because they thought it wasn't relevant or noteworthy. And so there was some discussion uh, between Satoshi and others about how to uh, get this article uh, so Wikipedia would accept it. And what Satoshi did is he actually suggested a stub article, a single sentence that describes Bitcoin. And the way he phrased it was the following. Bitcoin is an implementation of Wei Dai's B money proposed on cypherpunks in 1998 and Nick Sasbo's Bitgold proposal. So Satoshi at this point did see positioning Bitcoin as an extension of these two ideas or an implementation of these two prior systems as a, a good explanation of, of how it worked. However, from the previous slide, uh, it seems that Satoshi actually didn't know about these two systems when he came up with the original design of Bitcoin. Now, what about everything else? The Chami and eCash, uh, you know, all the credit card proposals that we looked at, all the microtransactions. What about all of that stuff? Did he know any of that history? Well, the answer is we don't know what he did know or what he didn't know, but he didn't give any indication really of knowing that history. And it's just as likely that uh, he didn't uh, reference this because it just wasn't relevant to Bitcoin. Bitcoin used a completely different model, and so there's no reason to talk about these old systems that failed. He does mention in passing Chami and eCash in one of his blog posts uh, when he's talking about another proposal called opencoin.org, and he notes that they seem to be talking about the old Chami and Central Mint stuff, but maybe because that was the only thing available. Maybe they would be interested in going in a new direction. A lot of people automatically dismiss e-currency as a lost cause because of all the companies that failed since the 1990s. I hope it's obvious it was only the centrally controlled nature of those systems that doomed them. I think this is the first time we're trying to decentralize non-trust-based system. So this gives a really nice idea, a nice view of what Satoshi thought of the earlier proposals and specifically how he felt Bitcoin was different, which is that Bitcoin moved in a decentralized manner. And from our study of all the previous systems, we can see that this is true, that this is a defining feature of Bitcoin that's not present in a lot of the systems that we looked at. Another interesting quote uh, from Satoshi suggests that maybe he's not an academic. A lot of academics think about ideas and write them down immediately. Satoshi says that he took an opposite approach. He says, I actually did Bitcoin kind of backwards. I had to write all the code before I could convince myself that I could solve every problem. Then I wrote the paper. I, w I think I will be able to release the code sooner than I could write a detailed specification. A final question we may ask ourselves, colored by what we understand from the history of eCash, is why does Satoshi maintain his anonymity? The first reason might be it's just for fun. Uh, there's lots of people that write novels that are anonymous. There's graffiti artists like Banksy that, that maintain their anonymity. And at that time in the community that he was involved in, the cypherpunk community and the cryptography mailing list, there were lots of people that were posting on that mailing list uh, in an anonymous fashion. The second uh, that ties a little closer to, to what we've seen is maybe there were legal reasons that he was concerned uh, about revealing his identity. Uh, there were a couple events in particular that led up to the release of Bitcoin, where two other proposals, one was called Liberty Reserve, and the other eGold, which we talked briefly about, uh, ran into legal trouble for money laundering. Uh, in particular, in 2006, the CEO or the founders of Liberty uh, Reserve actually fled uh, the United States uh, because they were afraid they were gonna be indicted on money laundering charges. And for eGold, the founders, uh, stayed in the United States and they were actually indicted and eventually pled guilty uh, to the charges. And this guilty plea was registered uh, just right before Satoshi uh, started the Bitcoin and uh, website and started emailing people about his proposal. Um, that said, there's lots of people that invented eCash systems and nobody else was scared of the legal implications and no one else remained anonymous as well. So this may have been a reason, it may not have been the reason. 
Another thing is that we mentioned that certain aspects of eCash were, were patented. And if you go back to the culture of the cypherpunk movement, they were concerned about implementing eCash systems uh, because they may violate the patents of uh, some of this, the technology that was, was patented. And so here's a post uh, proposing that, for example, uh, they launch a project to implement David Chom's eCash system, which was subject to a patent, and they do it under the guise of anonymity uh, so that uh, no one knows who they are, and then if they get sued for violating the patent, no one can uh, find them uh, to actually issue the, the lawsuit. A final reason that's often cited is that because Bitcoin uh, was so successful uh, and Satoshi has a lot of Bitcoins that are worth a lot of money, that maybe he's doing this for personal security reasons. And this could very well be the, the reason why he maintains his anonymity. Choosing to be anonymous isn't a decision you make once, it's something that you He understood that it could be successful, uh, but he wasn't a perfect oracle of the future. Uh, he made mistakes just like everyone else, both in the code. He had some features uh, that he added to Bitcoin, like sending money to IP addresses that never caught on. No one thought they were useful. Uh, when he described what Bitcoin was useful for, uh, he gave a bunch of use cases that were very centered on the idea of using it across the internet, which of course is a huge use case for Bitcoin, but it's not the only one. Uh, he didn't really envision it being used by stores going into a coffee.